حضرك بالعزاء عد فاطمة دين توفيك بمماتك إذا ما لك على قوية لحسين إذا ما لك على قوية لحسين شد فيدك صلاتك صدقني عظيمة دمعة العين تغفت سيئاتك اي معجزة الخداع تظهر بقيامه قول معجزة الخداع تظهر بقيامه اي وقت الخوف انت تشوف الخير كله في المدينة يا طبعك على المظلوم عندك خلي صيحة والزهرة تسمع إذا ما طايف حسين بضريحة إذا ما طايف حسين بضريحة يا حج لي نفحك وحسن اليرفعات وحسن اليرفعات على اجري زار مره شنو حجه والف عمره اجري زار مره حجه حجه والف عمره اي بكل تصريح ما تصيح الخير كله بخدمته على مشي بيانات انت بسيرة القاه بجرة مينة بجرة مينة ما شايعتني وصرخ حسينا ما شايعتني سين مولاه بإشكال دينه اسمع أي جبريل بعظمته خاتم يما شفته جبريل بعظم خاتم يما شفته أي هل مرسول هو يقول شو يقول الخير كله خدمته هلا الخير كله يا من خايف الخير اهدم واترك الخير يا من خايف الخير اهدم واترك الخير لعبك دين عند حسين غير كله خدمته غير كله خدمته اي دواب اللي تصدق ذنبين 
ينزع جهنم منا تبرد اذا تنهو الثواب لينفق المال في خدمة العشرة في خدمة العشرة اذا تنطي لابو سجاد مسقاد يرد الصاع عشرة يرد الصاع عشرة غني حسين هذا واقع الحال وحنا اليم فرح وحنا اليم فرح ابو سجاد ما يحتاج واحد ابو سجاد ما يحتاج ما يحتاج واحد اي كل الكون يعرفون الخير كله بخدمته الخير أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على خير خلقه أجمعين محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المنتجبين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أصحابهم الغر الميامين واللعن الدائم على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليكم مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم لبيك داعي الله لبيك إن كان لم يجبك بدني عند استغافتك ولساني عند استنصارك فقد أجابك قلبي وسمعي وبصري سبحان ربنا إن كان وعد ربنا لمفعولة آمنا بالله قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والذين يتوفون منكم ويذرون أزواجا والذين يتوفون من <تصفيق> والذين يتوفون منكم ويذرون أزواجا وصية لأزواجهم متاعا إلى الحول غير إخراج فإن خرجنا فلا جناح عليكم فيما فعلنا في أنفسهن من معروف والله عزيز حكيم آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم وبلغ رسوله الكريم وصدق مولانا أمير المؤمنين ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين والشاكرين 
Walhamdu lillahi rabbil alamin. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadi wa alihi al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala muhammad. Respected brothers and sisters. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Uhtula namunsa nebu siso zagazimu zibana nyonke khotu. Matokono luli Muhawa mudimu ubele luna Kaufela Inshallah Joining us on what is now After the massacre Sunday sessions Instead of Saturday sessions Welcome you and we wish Peace and blessings And The mercy of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala God almighty To be upon you uh, in the previous lectures, we were discussing and talking. Uh, the first lecture for, for this Saturday sessions was uh, the praise, the praise of poverty. To, uh, and then last week, it was charity and alms. Then last week, it was charity and alms. This week... This week, our discussion is this week, our discussion is a uh, inheritance and family expenses. Okay. Um, so before we go into that, here's a question, trivia question. Did you know, and then I don't know, maybe via the comments or via liking, you can, you can tell us, did you, what is the first thing that Abu Abdullah al Hussein sallallahu wa sallam um, did when he got to Karbala. One point that I want to emphasize from the previous lectures before answering this question is, uh, you remember we said that لكل شيء in waj, everything has a face, and the face of your religion is salah. But because in the Holy Quran salah is always mentioned mentioned with zakat, what does this mean? It means that if the face of our religion is salah then the body of our religion is zakat. Just wanted to emphasize this. What is the first thing? Do you know? What is the first thing that Abu Abdullah al Hussein did when he got to Karbala? What is it? Who knows? Okay, other than arriving there, uh, other than asking what the place is, is named, what is the other thing that he did when he got there? Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam bought the land of Karbala. He bought it. Uh, Sheikh Muhammad al Hilli uh, from Britain was, uh, did a beautiful question and answer during the first 10 nights of Ashura on Thakalain Media. You can find them on Twitter, uh, what's this? Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So, on Twitter too, I believe. So, he was answering the question why. Um, the enemies of Imam al Hussein bur either buried their own or took their own, uh, their own dead. We can't call them martyrs. The martyrs are those on the side of Imam al Hussein. What? Why didn't? Why they buried their own or took their own, but did not bury those the martyrs of Abu Abdullah al Hussein? This could be because they were all on Imam al Hussein's land. He bought the land. Sheikh Muhammad al Hilli gives. Several answers, but this could be what the, the history doesn't. But this could be one of the reasons why, because it was his land. They could not do as they please on his land. He bought the place. Okay, that is what Abu Abdullah al Hussein. So today, uh, even when you go to Iraq today, they speak about al Karbala al Qadima or Karbala al Jadida. Karbala al Qadima, the old Karbala, is where the battle happened. A few acres like that. Uh, where the actual battle happened. That land Imam al Hussein bought. The extensions and whatnot that happened later through development are then not part of this. So, even that ruling that says that when you're in Karbala, you can perform full salah, some Maharaj say that it, it's restricted to the old Karbala, basically stretching from the Euphrates till uh, Hay al Hur, where Hur bin Yazid, Ariyah Hay. Uh, is buried. Very interesting discussion about Horror Riyazi. 
حر ابن يزيد الرياحي why he's buried so far had a very beautiful conversation with my teacher Sheikh Faras Al Gatsawi about it. But Imam Al Hussein bought the land. What does that mean? This means Abu Abdullah Al Hussein was very rich. Abu Abdullah Al Hussein was moneyed. He had guap in, in uh, today's terminology. He got to the place and bought it. That's the first thing he did. Yeah. So please, praising poverty, please put it aside, eh? We are people here that want to, that need to gather uh, wealth. We are in this world not because, uh, what does the hadith say? Work for this world as if you're going to live forever and work for the hereafter as if you're going to die tomorrow. So we work here, we, 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 we earn a living, we uh, gain sense so as to live. As we all know. But just like his predecessor, Imam al Hassan, as well, how many stories have we heard about Imam al Hassan giving? I think in his life, he did it twice or, twice or thrice that he gave away half of his wealth and not some wealth, because even the way uh, uh, Imam al Hassan used to dress, it says that it is said that you should dress like the kings of the time. Yeah, he was moneyed as well. Imam al Hassan, is just that. The, the different uh, political atmospheres of the different imams dictate how they showed uh, their wealth, basically, or how they show, how they dressed, or how they carried themselves in public. But Imam Al Hassan, it can't be disputed. He had this thing, yeah. And Imam Ali too. Uh, about Imam Al Hussein, um, about Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam. Tonight is the night on which uh, the eve of the day he was martyred by poison. Inshallah, we'll talk. Um, and two days ago, uh, it was the martyrdom of Ruqayya bint al Hussein alayhi salam. So, inshallah, we will um, add this to the last part of the lecture, inshallah, just to mention about how Imam al Hassan alayhi salam was martyred. So, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Even Imam Ali alayhi salam. You know, there's this perception that Imam Ali, you know, Fakir was poor and whatnot. Yes, uh, uh, Sufis will tell you that they trace their roots to Imam, Al- Imam Ali, alayhi salam, and so on and so forth. So he, he was poor and what? He was not. He was not. If, if you can go to uh, Kufa today and then next to the mosque, next to Masjid al Kufa, his house is preserved. You can go there. Uh, go to Kufa. Go to Kufa, and then that house is preserved. And then tell me that that is a house of a poor person. No, he lived, he lived in a small house. It was a humble abode. No, no, it was not. It's actually quite big. Even in today's standards, the house is quite big. That's the surprising thing. Imam Ali also had um, in Medina, not Fadak, because Fadak was usurped and whatnot and whatnot, was given to them back and forth. But even in Medina, he had a piece of land which gave him, they say, 5,000 dinars. 5,000 dinars every year. Then, yes, he would give it out in charity, spend it there, make sure that his family is taken care of, because uh, what does that verse say? The one that uh, people misuse the one that speaks about do not throw yourself to destruction. It's actually a verse I mentioned this in uh, many a times. It's actually a verse about economics and not about killing yourself. Actually, so one of my teachers he says like it's like holding an egg half w- with two eggs and then releasing it with two eggs. Two eggs is making sure that you are taken care of, and the other two eggs you give out in ch- two fingers. Sorry, you give out in charity. So that that is what Imam Ali alayhi salam used to do. We should make sure that his family is covered for for the whole year and then give out the rest. Then, and this is the point, that you have to kun ghaniyan, be rich, but do not show your riches. See, this is what we get from all three imams. 
Imam Ali, Imam Al Hassan, and Imam Al Hussein alayhim salam. They had the money, but because of the different atmospheres, they the way they showed it was different. So this is the lesson for us that no, you have to be money, you have to be wealthy, you have to be well off, you have to afford your lifestyle. But then don't show it. Live within your means and don't show it. Also that no, now I and now I'm a millionaire from born and or a posh. You see, especially when you are in, in leadership position, especially in religious leadership position, because then the criticism is rife. Then the criticism is rife. And it's difficult, you know, because some uh, religious scholars are, are business people and whatnot. They have money. They have monies of their own, but they cannot freely spend it because it will be said that the Abaja child they are put here. Those kind of things. But generally, everyone, you should, especially as a leader, you know, the your means, your expenditures must be moderate. I'm not saying too low, I'm not saying too moderate. Understandable. Because, you know, um, um, as Imam Ali alayhi salam taught, do not blame anyone. If you put yourself in a blameworthy position, do not blame anyone for blaming you. But this is the thing. La tabkhas. La tabkhas as the Quran says. Okay, fine. Let's say this one person does become a millionaire. How about you? Santa um, Tameka, it's bad that we use cars as an example and as a status symbol. But he can afford, now he can afford a Merc. He can buy it, no problem. We're not saying he should, but he can buy it, no problem. You see? Because he can afford it. It doesn't take him out of his means. It doesn't hurt his pocket as much. La Tabchas, yes, of course, live comfortably, but be moderate. Don't be extravagant. That's the word I was looking for. So this is one lesson that we have to internalize. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, after asking, after landing in Karbala, after asking what the land is called, he bought the land in this order. He arrived in the place, asked what the place is named, and bought the place. How? What does this mean? about his financial capability, that he just arrives in a place and then he buys a big... It's big, Batum, subhanAllah. The, even today we say new Karbala, old Karbala, and old Karbala is small. Old Karbala is also very big. It's very big. Stretching from the Euphrates. Oh. So it, it's... Yo. <laughs> in soccer field, yo, let me not even me measure it in football fields, but he had that money ready on him that no, he can buy. But look at how he lived. You see, that's the thing. And also don't forget that he went to Hajj. You don't go to Hajj for free. So it was never free to go for Hajj. That's why one of the rulings when you go for Hajj is that when you going and returning to Hajj, it must not affect your financial status or your capability. So you have to save Go for Hajj and come back and then not struggle for life to continue. That's one of the conditions. So he was money. Ruhi lahu al-fida. Salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. However, there's this, uh, because today we are talking about family expenses and uh, inheritance. Somebody may come with the argument that no man, uh, you are mistaken about saying that poverty is not praiseworthy uh, because the Quran in Surah Nur, uh, chapter number uh, chapter number 30, verse number uh, 32, what does it say? Uh, it says it's the verse that speaks about marrying those who are single in a community and then 
Allah will enrich them. وَأَنْكِحُ الْأَيَامَ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وَأَنْكِحُ الْأَيَامَ مِنْكُمْ وَالصَّالِحِينَ مِنْ عِبَادِكُمْ وَإِمَائِكُمْ وَأَنْكِحُ الْأَيَامَ مِنْكُمْ and marry those who are single from amongst you والصالحين and those who are pious مِنْ عِبَادِكُمْ وَإِمَائِكُمْ from Your, uh, your servants, uh, your ma- male and female. In yakunu fuqara. You see? So Allah is saying that no, if they're poor, poverty it has a place. In yakunu fuqara, yughnihimullahu min fadl. If they are poor, then Allah will enrich them from His grace. Wallahu wasi'un alim. So when I'm saying, Chinyan, you are mistaken to say that Poverty is not praiseworthy because uh, chapter number 30 of the Holy Quran, verse number 32, speaks about how Allah will enrich them from His grace. They can be poor. Allah will enrich them from His grace. Point number one, He will enrich them. It means that they will change. So it means that, yes, they are poor or uh, uh, let's let say not poor, let's say suffering poverty. Suffering from poverty, as if it's an illness, when they get married. And then Allah will change that situation. And don't forget, Allah doesn't change the situation, uh, circumstance of people until they change their own situation. Again. So now they have to move. Now the movement has to come. Again. Now the movement has to come. At the time of marriage, yes, they can be poor. But Allah will enrich them from His grace. Here, Allah's grace can be different. Okay? I was mentioning sometime that when Allah says He can marry them, uh, if the thing is most of us, we think tawfiq only means, we, mean, we think success means money, we think tawfiq means enrichment, we, mean, we think Allah answering our du'as is money. Unfortunately, all of our, that's generally what we see. But when we say that Allah will enrich them from their grace, it means that Allah might inspire them with an idea to start a business, inspire them with some courage to go to get a job, to get an income somehow. But they have to because He will not change their circumstance until they change their own situation, as we said. Also, this verse, it says that if they are poor, Allah will enrich them. Who is poor here? Uh, who is uh, impoverished here? Who is suffering from poverty here? Is it the man only? Or the woman too? Or No, it, it, it's in plural. So it could be all everyone involved, even the parents of the woman, the parents of the man. All of them. Very interesting uh, thing that we were discussing uh, with Murud Alin Chinyan um, concerning the word the word Abd, for example. He says that he'll discuss it one day, so I'm just giving you a glimpse. It does not mean slave, it means servant. And this is different because a servant has a contract. A slave is forced. He'll discuss it. Anyway, so it means that When the Quran says, marry this, those who are single and pious from amongst you, from your servants, it means, yes, he will discuss it when the time is right, inshallah ta'ala. So all of them, it could be all everyone involved who is uh, struck by poverty in this case, yeah? So I don't know how does this work when it says he will then enrich them from his grace. I remember uh, we were having a discussion with one of uh, my uh, close uh, brothers and he was he said something very interesting about some guys like ah that guy I don't know that guy why doesn't he get married I'm like no but he's not employed but he's like okay sharp still lives at, uh, still lives at home yes it will be difficult but she can eat what he eats sometimes a serving that Hussein Chinyani eats on his own is actually for him Akila and Akila's mother 
just saying, you see, from Paraka, from blessing, and that's that you know when you eat food and you share it with people, <laughs> that's when it's more filling instead of when you eat alone. So he, she can eat whatever he eats in his family, or vice versa, he can eat whatever she eats in his family. So marriage should not be difficult. It should not be difficult. This thing, I could know before you marry, six figures, this and that, and so on and so forth. Yes, culturally, Lobola, everything. The, this is something that I've been telling people in, uh, very recently, a lot, actually. I'm like, deposit is like a sale. Even now, when you go and deposit your car, you can already take it. The deposit is tantamount to a sale. So going and negotiating Lobola and leaving something, the rest will come. That suffices a marriage. I get That's how it is. So marriage should not be difficult. For those, this is a discussion for those who uh, legitimize and believe uh, and fund them. Is it a word? Okay, take as fundamental the practice of Lobola in marriage. It's not an Islamic condition, but hey, we'll have a convert- conversation about that at another time. So this means that the movement and the effort to change the, the circumstance comes from both. It comes from both. The wife and the husband. It's not one-sided. It's not only the wife who works and then the husband stays at home. It's not only the husband who works uh, and the um, wife stays at home. Do, there, we can have a discussion about this. And uh, if you want to say that, no, women must be uh, must stay at home. Their place is in the kitchen. Habibi, a woman can be, can be hired for breastfeeding. That's a job. This is, I'm telling you things that used to happen at the time of the prophet. That was a job. That was an employment in itself. Okay? Okay. So, فَالْحَرَكَةُ عَلَى الْإِثْنَيْنِ Both of them need to, need to work towards changing their um, circumstance, changing their own situation. Okay? And then we see, but now, coming to today's topic, inshallah ta'ala, uh, uh, because we've already have had what twenty five minutes introduction up to so far. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. But now coming to today's topic, we refer to chapter four of the Holy Quran, verse number thirty four. Very famous verse that we always discuss. There are many discussions to have about this verse. Is beating your wife allowed, and so on and so forth. There are many discussions in just this one verse. But it starts by saying, chapter number four, verse number 34. Men are guardians over women. Due to what God has preferred or graced others of amongst them over others. And due to what uh, the men spend from their money to take care of the others, of course. And so on and so forth. Up to this is up to this part. This is what I want to discuss. But what the men, um, the men they spend from their money. They spend from their wealth. They spend from their income. Chapter number four, verse number 84. Akir. So at this point, because it's, it's, a, it's a wajib upon us as men, we need to move our minds. The, um, some years ago, uh, Sheikh um, Golan Mbonan, excommunicado, Hafizahullah. He, we had a conversation. He, he says that you know the problem is once you become a scholar, people want to want to limit you, they want to restrict you. 
no, you can't work here. No, you can't work here. No, but if you work here, you won't be available for the community. No, you won't. No, no. But then at the end of the month, it's you who's left with the expenses, the debit orders, the <laughs> need for grocery and whatnot, the limits and whatnot and whatnot. You see? So that conversation obviously changed a lot of my perception. But it also taught me something that as a man, generally, as a man, do not be shy or ashamed of your source of income, of your halal source of income. As a man, you should never be shy or ashamed of your halal source of income. And there are many options, Allah. It's just that uh, some are diffi- getting difficult or uh, physically tolling. There's a lot you can do. Take a lot. Deliveries, Mr. D. Can work retail. There's yo, there's online jobs now. Amazon, what, what? If you have fiber in, in the place that you stay, Anything, the hustling, just selling something, buying and selling, whether online or physical, there's a lot that we can do. There's a lot that can be done. I repeat the words of Muruti Ali Chinyani, it's not about what you love to do, it's about doing what you can and getting paid while doing it. This is the most important thing. Because expenses are not going to say, hmm, oh, well, she doesn't, uh, she doesn't love working uh, retail. He loves, he loves working in an office. Oh, well, let the bills wait. Let the bills wait for him to get a job uh, in an office. Then we'll send him the electricity. No, Maspala wants you to pay. You have to pay. You have to buy electricity. You have to pay for water. You have to pay levies. You have to pay taxes. You have to, you have to pay. The, those things are not going to wait for you to get your dream job. So do what you can and get paid while doing it. There are some jobs that don't need a uh, skill. There, there are some jobs that don't need much skill, no, not much studying, not much um, training, in fact, Why don't you look at those jobs? We should take those jobs and work. Apply, apply, get a job. Uh, make dua, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you tawfiq to get that job. Ask other people that no. Okay, I can, we, don't, we don't want to, we don't like mentioning uh, what we are praying for. So just tell brothers, my brother, I am my brother, I am struggling, ne? So I applied for a job somewhere. I'm not going to disclose where. But please, I really need this job. Please make the offer. And then that, we know, what does Imam Ja'far Sadiq say about the dua? An dhahril ghaib. That the one who, whenever they supplicate for you, there are two kinds of, there are several kinds of dua. But one of, dua, one of the duas that will never be rejected is when your brother prays for you in your absence. So once you apply for the job, once you send your CV here, 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 here. Uh, strict with your salah, strict with your salah to lukhufayl, strict with your nafila to salah to layl, asking other brothers to make dua for you, always being in tahara. This is important because when you're in tahara, Imam Jafar Sadiq again, alayhi salam, teaches us that if you want something and you go for it without tahara, do not be surprised if you don't get it. That's how important tahara is. So always be in wudu, job interview, wudu. I know you'll get nervous and break the wudu. <laughs> but may always make wudu. Always be in wudu in a state of purity whenever you seek something. This is important. Rabban. And then you make dua and then Allah. That is the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You'll see the barakah in that income, in that salary, in that in those wages, in that pay. That is the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Because there is no one, there is no one coming to save you. There, there's this uh, saying going around on Facebook now, on social media, what do they say? That hey, people must learn that there's no one coming to save them. Somebody is coming. Sharif. But we have to change our own situation for Allah to change our circumstance. Mm. We have to change our situation so that Allah changes our circumstance. So it's basically not the awaited savior, al-muntadhar. It's al-muntadhir, the awaiting. He's waiting for us, for us to be ready. Allah ta'ala farja. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasten his reappearance. You see, so that's the thing. Even uh, coming back to fin- speaking about finances, it, there's no one coming. There's no one who's going to give you uh, seven thousand every month while you just sit in jail. Nobody's going to give you. So do what you can and get paid. Stop waiting for doing what you love. This is a beautiful, like I'll quote, the, I can quote this every day and in every conversation when we, when we talk about this. From the wise old Sheikh, Madara Uchihan, Muridi Ali Nchinyan, Hafizahullah. Nobody's coming. Nobody's coming to save you, proud your finances. You should work for yourself, you see. So up to so far, we have discussed that, no, Surah Nisa tells us that as a man, we must, what, pay? Because yes, that one, uh, upon, it's upon us as men. Yes, alhamdulillah, we, 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 um, oh, let me backtrack. I said that do not be ashamed or shy of, of being in poverty, of any job or any a source of income, again, Instead, what should you be shy of? The opposite. You should be shy of being poor. Why? Because even the Quran, what does it say? Is that it says that those who are poor, those who are who don't have such good financial capabilities and strength, what does it say about them? When other people who don't know their 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 situation, what does it say? Those people will say, "Hey, these people are rich, man," or "These people are these people are okay, they are well off." What, what um, this is what Surah Al Baqarah, verse number uh, two hundred and seventy-three. Surah Al Baqarah, verse two seven three. You quickly find it, so you quote it verbatim. Agir. Two seven three. Bismillah ar rahim And the fuqara al-ladhina ahsiru fi sabilillah la yastati'una darban fil ard yahsabuhum al-jahiluna agniya amin al-ta'afwuf. So we should be instead shy of appearing poor. Being poor. This is what the Quran tells us that no, those who are who do, who are not who are not so well off, those who are those who don't know their situation will think these guys are well off. Because the way they dress, the way they carry themselves, don't look like your problems, as they say on social media. So you should be shy of whatever job you do, born. Halal income, whether you work at the city council and your job description says you have to dive in the manhole to unblock the Najasa, you'll do Husul Habibi, don't worry. Don't be shy of that. You'll be getting a halal income and taking care of your family. No problem at all. But now, uh, for four months, six months, one year, seven years, without being employed, that's something to be... Uh, worried about then let's not say ashamed because we'll break a few hearts that's something to be worried about month end is gonna come uh, uh, city council wants their money for water for electricity for this for that Aguila uh, needs this and that uh, 
it's a problem now when there's no income. You see, now you get into that uh, uh, monthly stress and depression. Ish, ish, we start now. In the month of Ramadan, I said that I was giving a lecture. I said that if you are a man, if you are a man and you get stressed every month, then that's good. It will refine you. It will push you that by the next month end, there must be a difference, <laughs> inshallah. But now, hey, we wallow. I get it. it becomes difficult. But don't be shy of whatever source of income. Do not be shy or ashamed of whatever source of income. Be worried when there's no source of income. That's a difficult situation. That is a very difficult situation. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that for themselves, not even for their worst enemies. Because us as men, it's our duty. Us as men, it's our duty to take care of our families financially. We have to do it. It's wajib. Yes, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy and bless the patient women who help out their husbands when they are not so okay financially. May Allah have mercy on them. But let's not for, forget that it's his responsibility. I'll even whisper and tell the lady something. Write it down. Whatever you use to, <laughs> whatever, you, whatever amount you use in the household, to take care of the household, write it in a small onion journal there. Then when that guy gets his salary, we'll again not pay up. You see, I wrote here that in June 2022, I paid the, the electricity. I was not supposed to. It's yours. I was responsibility as the man. Let her bring it. <laughs> you see? But may Allah subhanahu wa really, ta'ala, uh, there are some great women out there uh, who won't even write the journal. She can, she doesn't have to. But there are some women who will not. May Allah have mercy on them and bless them abundantly, inshallah. But this does not mean, unfortunately, that when the man is now not so well off or in trouble financially, that umutelian, that he must be disrespected, that he must be uh, uh, undermined, that he must be, everyone must know that, yeah, it's me who's buying that one there with his beard. He's not doing anything. No, let's not do that as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. But it's our responsibility as men. We have to do it. If Even if she doesn't, let me also give advice to the brothers. Even if she does not write down that, no, she paid the electricity for X months, and she says, no, it's fine, I was helping out my husband. When you get your bonus in December, I Baba, take her out, Baba. Robin, King, Peshaya, Cape Town, take me, like, pay her in kind. Show her that you appreciate her, inshallah ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us holidays with our family, inshallah. That's a powerful dua. Say ameen. Um, the topic is expenses and inheritance, I guess. So, yes, the man, that this one doesn't even need a discussion, even after talking for almost uh, 45 minutes, doesn't need a discussion. Khuri men have to take care of their families. Yes, alhamdulillah, may Allah have mercy on and bless the women who are patient, but men have to do it. It's our duty. We have to do it. If you don't, if you don't do it, if you don't do it and you can, you are in trouble. You can take care of your of your, your, your wife and children and you don't do it. I you are in trouble, Baba. Me personally, I won't pray behind you. You're leading salah, and then I know for this guy he can afford to take care of his family and he doesn't I know I don't think you are just I don't think you qualify to lead prayers I Alhamdulillah expenses done but now when it comes to inheritance we must ask ourselves something tomorrow inshallah we'll be talking about life cover insurance 
and funeral cover and so on. So it will link with this part ne, of inheritance. As a man, as a parent, as a human, you must ask yourself, what am I going to leave behind? Ne, other than the sadaqa jaria, other than the, what are you going to leave behind for your children for a startup? So that when you are gone, they can say that, Ish, you know what, ne, eh, my father may not have done a lot for me, but at least he built me a two-roomed house that I have now extended, it is now a 10-room house. At least he gave me something to start with. Or he left me with X amount to, you know? And obviously, this is important for the younger ones. For the younger ones, like I'm talking 30, that when your parents pass away, you're like, yeah, no, my mom left me with one, two, three. My father left me with one, two, three, so that I can start my life. Because life is difficult. I want but if, even for those who are older, it's their right at the end of the day. But especially for these younger ones, what are you leaving behind? It's, it's important. You have to always be thinking about that. Or what am I going to leave for them? Uh, hopefully, we'll exp- uh, not hopefully, surely we'll, uh, inshallah, expand on this when you speak about this uh, insurance, life cover, and funeral cover, inshallah. Ta'ala, these policies. This one of inheritance will dissect it further there. But as a, you must always ask yourself, okay, Sharp, I'm 30 years old, Akila is almost five years old. If now she's not in school yet, if it can happen, uh, can I leave at least something that uh, it will be hers, but I'll write in a will that I'm leaving you X amount that can, that can take you from grade one, from grade R up until metric at least. You must always be thinking in that way. What am I leaving behind? We'll talk about investments and whatnot and what you're leaving. We'll talk about this extensively in that lecture, inshallah ta'ala, because we have to break it up so that uh, for, for clear understanding, inshallah ta'ala. But now this verse, this verse that we uh, started with from Surah Al-Baqarah, eh, Surah Al-Baqarah, Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 240. وَالَّذِينَ يُتَوَفَّوْنَ مِنْكُمْ وَيَذَرُونَ أَزْوَاجًا وَصِيَةً لِأَزْوَاجِهِمْ مَتَاعًا إِلَى الْحَوْرِ غَيْرَ إِخْرَاجِ And then it goes further. I'll uh, translate this part now. فَإِنْ خَرَجْنَ فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي مَا فَعَلْنَا فِي أَنفُسِهِنَّ مِنْ أَنْ مَعْرُوفُ وَاللَّهُ عَزِيزٌ حَكِيمٌ And those of you who pass away leaving their wives, then they must write a will for their wives. They must leave something. They must bequeath their wives, not inheritance, just something that they leave. Wasiyatan uh, li'azwajihin. Ma ta'an ilal hawli ghayra ikhraj. So when you die now as a man, you must leave enough money. I'm, I'm translating and paraphrasing in one and explaining in one. You must leave enough money for your wife to sustain her life for a year. Gera ikhraj. Without being troubled, if you are rent for that whole year, she, the rent must basically be covered. Ask us what is you that whole year. So if she comes out of her own choice, then there's no problem for you in the grave, you will be arrested. Remember, if you pass away and you leave a wife, uh, Idda is four months, ten days. Idda. But what you leave for her financially should leave, should last her for a whole year. Chapter, bon, chapter number two, verse number 240. Write it down and check it. Chapter number two, verse number 240. Surah Al-Baqarah, Ayah 240. So when you die now, now, think about it now. Nah, I'll be the first to confess, no. <laughs> Maybe she won't even, um, she, she'll, they'll be struggling after. <laughs> I don't know how long. When you die now, you must leave enough money for your wife, basically, and, you, and your children, for food, for clothing, school fees, lifestyle, 
taxes, levies, uh, king, all these things for a whole year, 12 months. 12 months. That's the amount of money that you must leave now. Just think, think for yourself. Think to about yourself that if now you leave your wife, will she be able to leave to live a year on what you will can you and this is not part of the inheritance, like if this is a policy or something that was here, it's something that you put aside that no, this is for my wife to live for a whole year. Can you think about it while you do salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. So we have to work, brothers. We have to work. Not work. W-O-R-K. We have to work. W-E-K. With three exclamation marks. We have to work. Now if you can die. Really, it's not me speaking. I'm just expounding. Chapter 2, verse number 240 of the Holy Quran. It says, We must leave enough money that your wife can live a year without trouble. A whole year. Now, think about it. I'm not saying now, okay, uh, ish, uh, it should not be the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, yeah, we can heal in riches from his grace. Yes. And this is wasiya, it's not earth, I care. So it's not wajib. But it's something that you should always be thinking about when you spend your money, when you go out having fun and doing this and that. You must always think, okay, if now I can die, how long can my wife live without trouble? Or as soon as I'm, as soon as I, uh, uh, this possibly will link with the discussion that we'll have there about funeral cover, life cover, inheritance, and so on. But just think, if now I can die, how long will my wife live? Or as soon as Vele, as soon as they say, Isma wafham, ya Hussein ibn Suleiman in Chinyani, al anta al al ahdil ladhi taraktana, they read the talqeen for me. As soon as they do that, my wife is already stressing that, yar, landlord wants rent. Yar, electricity. So you are dead. First of all, you are deceased. She's crying that she lost her life partner for X number of years. And then she must also cry about the other expenses. Just think about it. So for you too, uh, depression is real. Yes, we all get stressed about money and everything. But uh, one of the good advices that I've seen on YouTube from... Um, can I give on Cobra Tate? says that we don't have, as men, we, we, we actually don't have, we, sh, we sh, ideally should not entertain the idea for of depression and whatnot and work. And work, just Islamifying this a little. No, we have to work hard as men. Work very hard. And have these finances in order. And have these things in order and set them right. Ne? Uh, not take time to be depressed. Just make it, use it as a motivation. That low, look, okay, fine. Kids are stressed this month. I can't afford one, two, three. Next month, inshallah. Next month, inshallah. In the next two months, inshallah. And then work towards that, inshallah. You see? Let's work, brothers. Brothers, let's work. Bartella <laughs> Muntlimu. On social media, the sisters, I could they always make that. Arba Swabi saying, I could they always make a joke that, yeah, brothers, the only Sunnah they, they know is polygamy, but they can't afford it. Then let's work. Then we afford. <laughs> then you afford. And then when you say, I want to marry two wives, which, which money? You show her the app. They say that, ah, no. I have this amount, half of it is yours, half will be for hers. I did him out, let's go papel. But just, you know, Islam of life is in this statement of 
uh, as a man, you should not cry. Yes, we should cry, of course. But Yabna Shabib in Kunta Bakian, Fabkil Hussein. Oh, uh, the son of Shabib, if you want to cry, cry for Hussein. So every problem that as a man, whenever you get it, remember Hussein, just say, he must have went through us. Displaced from his homeland, displaced from the land of Allah, and then had to, we call him Gharib, Mazlum Karbala, had to die in a stranger in the middle of a desert. Kufa is 90 kilometers one direction. Baghdad didn't even exist at the time. That's what Imam, that's the situation. And so then you cry for Imam Hussein. You say, yeah, I don't think I'm in trouble. But Abu Abdullah, you went through us. And then also this thing, uh, this is going to sound wrong. But even your love, let's not be drunken by love. Let us be careful. Let us be, let us be careful of uh, this kind of love. Love must be here, especially for us men. Love Imam al Hussein. Because what does uh, the Holy Prophet say? He says that, Ahabba Allahu man, Ahabba Husayna. May Allah love the one who loves Hussein. So dedicate your love to <laughs> Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and then use your mind and say that, okay, Sharp, I have to take care of my family. That, that scene, in, I'm sure you know it if you watch the movie, that scene in Fences gives us a good perspective about this. Why, why, do, why do I buy the food here? Because you like me? No, not because I like you, because I have to. It's my duty, you see. So let your depression be the depression for Imam al Hussein. And let your love be dedicated to Imam al Hussein, and you'll find yourself a happy man, a very functional and uh, beneficial man, even to uh, your family, inshallah ta'ala. I mentioned that two nights ago, it was the martyrdom of Asayda Ruqayya uh, bint al Hussein, alayha salam. And tomorrow, it will be the martyrdom of Karim Ahlul Bayt. Imam al Hassan alayhi afdal salatu wa salam. In, in his poem, Ali Asin, Mullah Ammar al Nashid asks, uh, he says, What did Zainab I see looking at Ali Asin? So I'll paste this and to link all the masaib that I'm going to talk about tonight, inshallah. We see that Zainab. When Imam Ali was struck on the head and bleeding, Imam al Hassan and Hussein carrying him, when he saw Zainab, he said, No, leave me. Let me walk straight. He walked. He walked and then he didn't want her to see. He didn't want her to see him in that weak state. That is Imam Ali. Alayhi salam. And then Karim Ahlil Bayt, alayhi salam, same thing with him. When his wife put that poison in his food, Ruhi Lahul Fida, and he ate that poison. See, from all the Imams, from all the Imams that were poisoned, none of them died the same day, except Imam Al Hassan alayhi salam. And none as excruciating and as cruel as Imam Al Hussein alayhi salam. The Iraqi poet says that Yal Fadu Kabda, that's how bad the poison was. He says that whenever he would cough, a piece of, it, of his liver would come. Aba Muhammad al-Hassan ibn Ali alayhi salam. Sibtun Nabi. That is the situation. Imam al Hussein crying over him. Imam al Hussein saying that, Oh my brother, what have they done to you? Who did this to you? Oh my brother, who did this to you? This horrible thing crying over him. And Imam al Hussein says, La yawmaka yawmaka ya Aba Abdullah. He says that, Oh Hussein, there is no day like yours. There is no day like yours. Your calamity is something else. Raziyatan ma a'adhamaha wa a'adham raziyatan fil Islam. But when Zainab comes in, what does he do? He says that, Oh Hussein, please hide. Please hide this dish, the one that he was 
uh, vomiting his liver into. He says, hide it, O oh, Hussein. I don't want Zainab to see it. Ramallahi uh, alayhi. Then Hussein saw, uh, Zainab saw Karbala. And this takes us to this little girl, Sayyidah Ruqayya, who was crying for her father. After the calamities that Zainab saw, that basically changed who she was, such that Fidda could not recognize her. Amma Zainab, I want my father. Please, my auntie, please bring me my, my father. Where is my father? I haven't seen him since the 10th of Muharram. Where is my father? She asks. Yazid al laeen hears the, the crying, the wailing. What are those prisoners, captives crying for? No, the little girl wants to see her father. Okay, take his father in. Take the head of her father, present it to her. They take the head in a golden dish and they put it in front of her. She says, I don't want food. They're like, no, open it. And she opens it and she sees the head of her father. Abaya Hussein, man a tamani ala sigharisin, she asked. Oh, Father Hussein. Who has orphaned me at this tender age? Oh, Father Hussein, who has done this to you? Oh, Father Hussein, who struck your lips that they are torn? As Hajj Khalifa said all those years ago, we do not know of anyone, anyone ever, who, can, who died due to grief. And this adds to the agony of Zainab al-Kubra. Jabal al-Sabr, Ruhi lahal fida. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to um, keep us and place us and place within us the love of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us of those who gather and mourn and discuss the affairs and revive the affairs of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless the men um, and give them incomes, jobs and businesses inshallah. Those who have, who are seeking jobs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by the barakah of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, the one who bought Karbala, we ask him to help the men in our community to um, those who are seeking jobs to get jobs, those who have businesses for the businesses to grow and be successful, and those who are hustling for Allah to bless their hustle, and those uh, in need, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve them of their needs inshallah we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on the deceased and to cure the ill and to send the re to them the reward of surah al-fatiha before it's salat ala muhammad wa ali muhammad allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ali muhammad wa ajil mufasah alhamdulillah rabbil alamin maliki wa muddin إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين عندنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين اللهم صل على محمد على لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسعلم الذين ظلموا على محمد أي مقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين